Yeah, thanks a lot for having me. Um, so, just to give you uh, a quick introduction, normally I'm not a recruiter. Yeah, so I mean, obviously I'm involved in recruiting quite a lot, but my job at Project A is not recruiting per se. But I think it's always good, and it probably also was Robin's idea uh, to give a little bit perspective, a different perspective on the recruiting market and. What we try to do at Project A, I'll come to in a minute uh, to what Project A is and why that is a little bit different from, from normal companies. Uh, what we try to do is, I think, something quite interesting because we try to transfer the learnings that we make in performance marketing or in, in digital marketing in general and try to transfer those learnings to the recruiting market because I think, or we thought, there's a lot of parallels. And what I'm going to talk about next 20, 25 minutes is basically describing to you why we thought this is a good analogy and why this journey uh, we think is, is the right path to choose. I have to very much uh, thank Marianne of the recruiting team Project A who prepared a lot of the slides. So I've taken a lot of his uh, thoughts here um, and uh, thanks for that. Yeah. So, so two elements of the presentation, but first I want to talk about quickly about what Project A is because I'm, I'm sure many people here will not know that. We are actually a venture capitalist here based in Berlin. Um, we invest uh, in early stage and Series A startups. Um, we manage roughly 260 million euros. Um, that's, for Germany, pretty decent size. I mean, if you compare it to the US, that's actually rather small. But uh, for, for Europe or for Germany, we're probably one of the larger uh, players. And the, the special thing about Project A, and that is actually the last point here, we try to support not only with money. I mean, that's what a normal venture capitalist does. I mean, a normal venture capitalist with roughly 260 million euros under management would probably have 12 to 14 people, max. We have 100 people. And of these 100 people, roughly 90 do operational support for the ventures. And um, roughly 10 of those 90 are working in HR, recruiting talent acquisition. Yeah? So, and we do that to support First of all, our own endeavors. I mean, we are a 100-people company. That's not necessarily very big, but also not very small. So we use that recruiting approach that I will be describing right now for ourselves. But we mainly use it to support the ventures that we invested in. That's roughly 50 ventures that we, that we invested in over the last six and a half years. We roughly do six to eight ventures per year. And when I describe this, um, what we try to do is we try to enable the companies that we invest in to do these things themselves. So there's a strong analogy, and uh, I just talked to Robin about it, there's a strong analogy to larger corporates yeah, that are trying to support their subsidiaries or um, investments that they did in how to do this. And that's also what we try to do. Yeah? We, so we try not only to be like an agency for these companies, but we actually try to enable them to work in this kind of way themselves. And it actually has proven to be quite fruitful because a lot of people understand where we're coming from. So what do I want to talk about? It's basically two questions or two, uh, two elements um, that we think you can learn from the marketing or digital marketing approach that you, that you see there. Um, and that's basically why are we, we, we taking this route. This digital marketing is kind of my heritage, but also a very strong DNA of the company. So our whole company kind of works a little bit how a marketing team in a, in a pretty decent B2C sales-oriented organization, so like a Zalando or Trivago, etc. So it's the same kind of thinking, and we try to um, bring this thinking to the recruiting piece. And this has kind of two elements to it. One thing that we figured is if you want to do very good performance marketing, and that sounds a little bit contradictory, you have to be very strong on brand as well. Why is that the case? Because what you figure out if you do performance marketing, performance marketing I probably need to define because this is like not the typical audience I talk to. But with performance marketing, I basically mean you do marketing where you put something into a marketing campaign, whether it's creatives, whether it's money, whether it's manpower, and you're able to track the actual outcome of this. That is what I define as performance marketing. And you basically try to, um, to steer the whole campaigns by the way uh, in which you're um, perceiving success in those various campaigns. And performance marketing is not strictly uh, restricted to, uh, to digital. It can also perform uh, like a Zalando or Trivago or Daily Deal or these kind of companies. They all have also done 
performance marketing in offline channels. Even with things like magazine ads, you can, you can run as in a performance marketing thinking. But the, the basic principle is I don't do any marketing kind of measure where I do not understand what I'm actually getting out of it. The good thing about this is you can only do that in a direct-to-consumer business, or it's easy to be done in a direct-to-consumer business. If you're Nestlé or uh, an FMCG that's selling indirectly via retail, that is not that easy to achieve. But if you're a direct-to-consumer business, then that's easy to achieve. And in fact, if you look at most recruiting activities, they are, if you look at it from an abstraction layer, they work like a direct-to-consumer business because you're addressing candidates or you're trying to attract uh, potential candidates and then they turn into candidates, then they are leads, and then you try to convert them in the sense of make them actually join your company and then you try to retain them. So if you look at this on an abstract level, performance marketing or direct-to-consumer marketing is like recruiting, yeah? Especially if you think about it that you want to retain or you want to attract the candidates and you want to sign the candidates that fit into your company and that will stay in your company. So the retention piece is just important as it is in performance marketing or in digital marketing. Because what you find out today, you will not find any successful consumer marketing company, direct to consumer marketing company, that's not good at retaining customers. If you don't have good customer retention, those businesses won't work. So Zalando wouldn't work if they wouldn't be able to convert users to do three to four purchases per customer per year. So the analogy is very clear. And the other thing that we found out is, if you want to be good at performance marketing, and that's why I raised this question, you need to be good on branding as well. Why? Because performance marketing works significantly better if your brand, your positioning, etc., is clear to the consumer. So mathematically speaking or statistically speaking, it's a moderating factor. You have your performance marketing measures, and if the brand is doing a good job, you'll have a higher performance, a better ROI. And we strongly believe that the same thing will be the case in recruiting. Yeah? And if you look how much effort is going at companies like Adidas or Nestlé or Zalando into the consumer brand, I find it kind of frightening how little is actually going into the employer brand. That's at least my perception. And the good thing about performance marketing and, and, and I'm, I'm not saying that not a lot of effort is going into it. That's probably the wrong way of putting it. But what I think the beauty about performance marketing is you can actually not only think that your branding is good, you can actually measure whether it will have an enhancing effect on your performance or it does not. Yeah? So it's not a static process where you just put out a certain brand and then you wait and just leave it static, but you can test different approaches and see whether different positionings, different messagings, different creatives, different type of presenting yourself leads to a better performance for your performance campaigns. And we believe that the same thing you can do in terms of recruiting. So that's why this first thing is, is relevant. So I'm trying to give you a little bit of a flavor of what we try to do there. And then the piece that I care most about, I mean, I'm a little bit of a branding person, but I'm much more of a data person. So that is basically my whole DNA, how can you actually measure recruiting success in a similar way that is done uh, in digital marketing? And we strongly believe that right now it's very much restricted to digital marketing. So if you compare the world, the, the marketing world of an Nestlé, of a Procter, of a Unilever to that of a Zalando or to that of an ASOS or to that of an About You, it's two different planets. Yeah? They're completely different, they have a completely different approach to marketing. And the main reason is the ones are able to track 100% through what actually comes out of their marketing campaign in case of a Zalando about you or an ASOS because most of the business that they have is happening on their website, in their app. And that obviously is not that easy if you're Procter & Gamble and you sell indirectly via Reva, etc. So I know where that comes from, but what we believe and what you can also see that the smart marketing companies also in the offline space, and that's why also the Proctors and the Unilevers are heavily investing into direct-to-consumer, because they basically understand if you continue to do marketing the way that we've done it for the last 30, 40, 50 years, 
we put out a TV campaign, and then we do some kind of measurement on an attitude kind of level or on a branding type of level, and then hopefully it will lead to a good ROI. That cannot be the way that marketing will work in the future in a more competitive space. And if you compare that to recruiting, you see exactly the same development. Yeah? Because as you all know, a lot better than me, we've definitely switched from a market where the employer was a strong side to a market where the candidate actually is in power. The candidate can choose where they want to work. And that problem will continue. Probably not in China, <laughs> but in all Western countries, yes. Yeah? So we need, to apply, uh, we need to apply it to the candidate and not vice versa. Yeah? And if you also look, company like Project A, we're actually pretty good by having uh, roughly a churn of only 25% per year. Yeah? So a fourth of the employees leave us every year. And that's standard in uh, the venture world or standard in the startup world. That seems to be standard in a kind of millennial-driven world. So the process of getting people in and retaining them becomes a lot more critical. And that's also why we think that having a much better understanding of how recruiting works in a more data-driven way will definitely help. Yeah, in the interest of time, because I mean, obviously, it's, it's a fairly large topic. I'm going to go through this kind of quickly. Um, but still, I hope that some of the concepts will, will stick or some of the ideas will at least um, be, be able to, to work with you. So what I think what's an interesting concept is, is the employer brand necessarily always the same as the consumer brand? And what I th would say today that if you have a strong consumer brand like a company like Adidas has, obviously the employer brand needs to be a little different from the consumer brand because obviously the consumer has different interests in the employer brand, um, in, in, the, in the consumer brand than the Im potential employee has in the employer brand. But there definitely needs to be a certain overlap. And for a B2B company like us, I mean, essentially Project A is a, is a B2B company, what we try to derive at is what we call an employer value proposition. So getting something out where we say, what is unique about Project A, or not necessarily unique, but what is something where we basically say, that is something that we stand for and that we can authentically fulfill. So for us, what we did, we went through a larger uh, value kind of finding process in the company. And one of the, the, the main values that we have in our, uh, our company is, is knowledge sharing. Yeah? So we came up with this content marketing concept where we said, OK, our DNA is really to share knowledge in the organization, to share it with the portfolio companies we invest in. So that is one of the core ideas of our employee val employer value proposition. And that actually led to a marketing campaign. So if you look at the communication that we do, uh, that we do today um, on Facebook, on LinkedIn, etc., a lot of it, or most of it, will center around at Project A is a place where we try to, do, to test out new things and we try to share this knowledge openly. We are an open source company. That's core of our DNA. We believe that sharing knowledge is good. And if you feel attracted to this, dear employee, if you like to share knowledge, if you like to work on new things and talk about it, this is the right place to be. And for us, that has worked really, really well. And I think that is something every company needs to find for themselves. And the difficult thing often is, especially if you're a consumer brand, how can you actually do something that builds on the core kind of DNA of the company, but is relevant to employers? And I think that is something that definitely needs to be refined and is different for every company. But having an employer value proposition and then test it against uh, what candidates actually like, that is definitely something that you need to put out there. And what we figured, especially if you look at where does most communication with potential candidates take place? And if you look at the reach numbers, what is the consumption that, or the content consumption that, that, um, that users have, not only in the younger age groups, but actually across all age groups, where's the content consumption going? Surprisingly, people still consume a lot of TV. I mean, that's probably not so much you guys, yeah? but uh, TV consumption is not stable. I mean, it goes down, but it's surprisingly sticky. But where does most of the consumption go to? It all goes to social platform based, pla it all goes to social based platforms like Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube. That's where people spend most of the time. And th that is also, and that is increasingly so. And that's what we are doing. We, so we try to do a lot of communication, authentic communication done by employees 
on those platforms and try to hammer out the employer value proposition. And why do we do that? We call that for us um, we call this for us the um, uh, basically a similar funnel as you would have uh, in the in the user acquisition space. So in the user acquisition space, you always work with models like AIDA, attention, interest, desire, action. Yeah. So you have potential users that are in your target group. You make them interested, you attract them, hopefully they will develop a serious interest, um, then hopefully in the next step a desire, then they will buy, and the follow-up model for the, for the AIDA model is then the retention, so the, the fifth step would be to actually retain people. And a very similar model we try to have here for us. So in the, uh, in the recruiting space where we basically say, okay, you need to put out employer branding messages based on the employer value proposition, proposition and you do that where our candidates are. I mean, obviously, we are an organization where the average age is below 30. That's the case in most startups. I mean, obviously, if you're Adidas or Bayer or Mercedes, that's a little different. But one should not underestimate how also the consumption or the content consumption of the 40-year-olds has changed and shifted toward Facebook. Probably not so much towards Instagram, but definitely towards LinkedIn, definitely towards Xing. Xing is surprisingly relevant still. Yeah, so I've always, I, I, I would have bet <coughs> a lot of money against Xing 10 years ago because I thought this thing would actually die quite soon. But also because I think LinkedIn is still a very shitty product if you look at it. Um, it's, um, it's surprisingly sticky. So, and that is actually where people move to, and that's where we try to get the messages out. And then, for us, it's really about how get, do you get people through the stage. And that is exactly what you do in consumer marketing. That's what a Zalando does, that's what an About You does, that's what you can do on Alibaba. It's really about how to attract people, make them interested, and then track how they actually move through the stage. And a good consumer company, what they would be able to do, they would be able to say, we distributed our messages to a million people, and 10,000 of those, they are actually interested in what we do because they clicked on it and they were on a landing page. And these 10,000 people, we track through the system, through their funnel. And a Zalando would be able to say, this consumer, they clicked on a Google ad three weeks ago, they came on the website, then they looked at three or four shoes, this dress, then we did a retargeting campaign, they came back. And that is exactly what we try to do in recruiting. So we try to build a very similar model to a consumer company in recruiting. Yeah? Because it's possible, it's more and more possible. It wouldn't be possible, obviously, if you do a lot of recruiting on some kind of fairs or if you do a lot of recruiting offline. But if recruiting goes more digital anyway, the picture of doing, or the, the, the concept of doing, following a candidate through a funnel and understanding where people are in a funnel becomes more and more realistic in recruiting. And what these companies are able to do, and I think that is at least a vision also for recruiting, they're able to say, these people had on average four or five contact points. The contact points were associated with this and this cost, and then they actually came to the, um, to the website and they applied online. I mean, it's sometimes a little difficult yeah, if people call or if people send you an email, you have to get it back into the system. But it's possible, and it's not always perfect. But one thing that I always uh, saw also in, uh, in, in performance marketing when we were starting to do the whole TV tracking with Zalando in like 2008, people are saying, yeah, but you cannot track TV this way because you will lose a lot of people and a lot of people will not uh, basically come to the website right after the TV commercial, but they will come three days later, how will you know? And what I always say is, yeah, that's true. These models are never perfect, but these models are a lot better than what you currently do. A lot better than what you currently do. So this is not about perfectly mirroring reality. This is about reflecting reality a lot better than the current approaches that's not doing anything in that area at all. Yeah? And one thing that I really learned in 20 years in digital is it's not about being perfect, it's just about being a little bit better than the competition. Yeah? And having a better understanding of how people move through a funnel and where you should invest. And one thing that I can really encourage you, people that really drive this to the top, 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 
is if you Google for uni marketing, so UNI marketing by Alibaba, Alibaba is able to say for any type of consumer brand, where are people in the Alibaba universe, which obviously that's Tmall, that's Alibaba, that's Alipay, that's several social networks, where are several users or where, where are specific users vis-a-vis -a, -vis a specific brand in the use case. So if you're Maserati, they'd be able to say, these many Chinese already know about you because they've talked about you on social media, whatever. Uh, and this is how you can actually move pe people through a funnel. So a good marketing company today, so Zalando and About You, etc., they should know if we want to grow further, where in the funnel do we actually invest our marketing money? Yeah? And the same goes for recruiting. Because if you have a funnel problem on the upper, in the upper funnel in the sense of two little candidates, then you need to invest more in employer branding. If you have a problem to attract people from basically an initial lead or screening to actually getting them signed, you need to invest in the process there and make it, uh, make it better and more solid. So it really drives the way you can do your recruiting. And I think the more and more of this whole stuff will become digital, the more realistic it actually gets. Mm. Just to give you, because we're almost, almost done, one thing that I wanted to show you, this is basically how an attribution model looks with a normal online company. That's a company we invested in called Horizon Studios. And on average, Horizon Studios, it's actually a pretty cool uh, luggage brand. On average, a new customer takes five contact points to buy a trolley or to buy something else from them. That's on average. And all of these touch points are obviously digital, so you can track them. Yeah? And if you have direct-to-consumer business or some people that have a direct-to-consumer business in your company, in the marketing piece, they should be able to do this for their consumers. And they will also be able to help you to do the same thing for recruiting. Yeah? I always ask myself why we didn't start this much earlier, because we started this like one and a half years ago, and we have all the people to do this in-house. We have like 20 performance marketeers at Project A that can do this, because they're doing it anyway for all the ventures and with all the ventures to do this kind of thing. But if you have a performance marketing team in-house, or if you work with a performance marketing agency in-house, um, um, uh, externally, these people no question asked, will be able to give you a similar kind of funnel for your recruiting process yeah, and a very good understanding. So, because if you look at it, if you look at the process below, the process above is the same kind of funnel we just went through for the consumer uh, piece and the, exactly the same journey you can track uh, for, you can track for a candidate. The problem always is, on a LinkedIn, you cannot track behavior on LinkedIn that easily. People need to click out of LinkedIn to be able to, to track them. But a lot of the stuff also within Facebook creatives, etc., cetera, you, you can track and you can, you can measure. I mean, it's not perfect, but you have a much better understanding um, than what, what, what can, how candidates actually move through the funnel than you would be without uh, this kind of thinking. And if you basically, let me just go because I just have five minutes. If you basically, if you basically look at what you can get out of it, what we're able to do, again, it's not perfect, and this is just, just some fantasy numbers, but what we're able to, to do for Project A is we're able to say, by doing this kind of funnel analysis and by associating costs with each stage of the funnel, how much we're actually spending per candidate through different channels. And what you find out, that's not surprising, that something like job boards by, worst have, by far have the worst ROI. Yeah, I mean, that's not surprising. Yeah, so the best is actually things like internal referrals. That's also not surprising. But here, you're able to actually quantify that. And that is something that we, that we try to do and that we try to progress, having a much better understanding of how people move through the funnel. What I cannot show you in the interest of time here is if you compare the different funnels for different disciplines. So if you compare tech people to marketing people, completely different funnels. And here you can actually see that yeah, by this kind of methodology. No tech person will apply on a job board. That's simply not realistic or not. It's very hard to get that. Not, not the good ones. Yeah, so you, you'll have to get them through performance marketing. And another thing that you can do, and that's what I meant by the retention piece, <coughs> it's the same thing 
when you started Zalando or when you started things like an About You, what you do is you track what does an order cost you and what do I earn with an order. But that's also a very limited perspective. The true perspective is you not only want to see what kind of customer you're getting, or what kind of order you're getting in that moment, you want to know what kind of customer you attracted. So the best companies in digital marketing are not, are not doing their marketing by what order cost me how much. What they're actually doing is which customer that I just acquired, how much does that customer cost me, and what is this customer worth over the lifetime? That's the true perspective. And that is the perspective that we took here by saying we don't take the candidates as equal, yeah? but we actually look at how long do the candidates that we get through a certain channel stay. Yeah? Is there a difference in fluctuation or in churn of candidates generated through different channels? So that would be the analogy to lifetime value on, on the consumer side, where you're actually able to understand, okay, we, we know that the referral candidates are not only cheaper, internal referral, but they also tend to stay significantly longer than candidates we get through other channels. That's also natural why that is the case, obviously. I mean, it makes a lot of sense, because if you have internal referrals, people will refer people where they think they make sense in the organization. So that's, it's all explainable yeah, why that is the case. But having a number that an internal referral not only costs you less, but will also stay longer, enables you to completely rethink how you think about internal referrals, for example. Because you say, I'm not giving people 500 euros or 1,000 euros, I give people 5,000 euros if they refer a good candidate. Because it's still cheaper, still cheaper than going through job boards or Stepstone or other dying kind of companies. Yeah? So, and that is something that it will, give you, it will enable you to do a systematic decision. And that's basically my message here. That's what we try to do in performance marketing. And with that, I stop. This is not about being right. This is about being better than being without this kind of thing and being systematic in your decision making. Because what drives me really mad <laughs> is unsystematic decision making. That's based on meeting performance, gut feel, whatever. And I think here you really have a, feel, uh, have a field where with relatively easy kind of approaches, you can become a lot more systematic. And if you look at the recruiting market today, I'm pretty sure that the systematism or this uh, approach can help you uh, becoming a lot better in terms of recruiting and a lot more systematic and a lot more data-driven. That's at least what we try on a small scale and obviously in an easy kind of market because startup market is always easier than a large corporate, I understand that. But just take the ideas and probably it gives you some or two, two, or, two or three ideas what you can do better in the future. That would be great. Thanks a lot. Oh, that's me. Do we have any questions? Yes, do we have any questions? I know we went a bit over time, but any urgent questions? Don't be shy. <laughs> no? Oh, there we go. Are you ready to catch? Hey, um, what sort of timeline would you say to put in a process? Like how long did it take you guys at Project A to actually map out everything and actually understand from all of the metrics that you collected what oh. you could do? I think on a, on a conceptual level, it's not that easy. <laughs> it's not that difficult. The difficult piece is really the implementation bit. Yeah, so um, a year, probably, yeah. But it, it really depends. I mean, we have all the people in-house, yeah? So we have the analytics people, we have the marketing people, it more depends on their capacity, so I think we could be a lot faster, yeah? If they wouldn't have anything else to do, but that, just that. But that's more for the marketing people as a side project to help the recruiting team in doing that, yeah? I mean, we have all the know-how in-house, and obviously you know, cannot adapt it one-to-one, -one, but you can only adapt it like 70, 80% and finding that out. But conceptually, it's not that difficult. It's more, it's, the other difficulty is if you are a consumer company, you have thousands of orders, yeah? If you are doing recruiting, you have, I don't know, you recruit, at least on our scale, 10 people per month. Yeah? So finding significant results is also a lot more difficult. Yeah? Because if you are, you don't need to be Zalando to have like a thousand orders. Yeah? That's like a Horizon has several thousand orders per month, although they're still a relatively small company. So there's some things that you need to adapt and, and think about, so that, and then you find out, oh damn, I don't, can, cannot really conclude anything from it because the numbers are so small, so what L other number can I use? So, but I would say, if you have the right people in place, a year. Okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
Hi. Um, are you using this data to evaluate as well the recruiters? Marianne, are we doing that? Are we evaluating the recruiters based on that? <laughs> I actually don't know. We could, but we don't, <laughs> I think. We shouldn't, maybe. We shouldn't. <laughs> no, um, <laughs> no, actually, uh, maybe it's important to mention that we are not only recruiting for Project yeah. A, but also uh, for our ventures. Um, so, um, acting as a strategic recruiting partner for our ventures, and of course, we have some um, KPIs uh, where each recruiter is like measured. Yeah, but you could theoretically use that. Yeah, yeah, yeah but you could sure. I mean, I, I think then it becomes because you know it, it, it's really you, it's. You run in the danger of comparing apples to, to pears. No? Uh, when you, for example, have somebody that's only doing developer recruiting. Uh, yeah, so uh, with that, I would be a little more shy to do that uh, than, than uh, using it to evaluate whether job boards make sense. Yeah? Um, so, but theoretically, if you, I think if you have reached a certain maturity of analysis, yeah? and uh, probably one thing that's also, I think, important. Um, a key learning, if you do these analytical approaches, also in marketing, is the department that uses the data should not use, should not do the analysis. Yeah. So uh, in AdWords, if you, if you do AdWords, for example, you can do the same analysis, and the AdWords person shouldn't run their own reports. It should be some BI department. Uh, and I think if you achieve a certain maturity in terms of analysis, then why not? Yeah. Because I think it can also help by evaluating who's better, and then you can try to find out why, yeah? I mean, it's not only about is that person good or bad, but it's also why, and then you, yeah, I think it definitely makes sense to think about that, yeah. But it's still kind of early thinking and, yeah, but theoretically, why not? I think you can learn. I, I think it needs to be clear to people that it's not always about if you're not good in this process, then you're fired, but it's also about improving everybody. And that's, that's a difficult thing, like the mind shift of saying, we provide you with data not to evaluate and control you, but we provide you with this data. That's also in marketing. It was a huge shift in the beginning. People didn't like transparency at first because they were afraid that you know, they would actually be punished based on this. And you said, it's not about punishing you. It's about us becoming a better team. Yeah? So, and, 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 and that is uh, you know, uh, not, not, uh, the, the, not that easy to achieve. So I think you need to establish trust in, in what you do and what the true motivation is. And it's not about controlling, but it's really about making people better and more systematic. But yes. Good idea, yeah. Yeah? Okay, so <laughs> we have a break until three, but just before you go, I'd like to give Dr. Florian Heinemann one last round of applause. Thank you.